Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and we bring this podcast to you every Wednesday as a veterinarian, as a technician, as a dentistry team to help you be even better at veterinary dentistry in your practice. We're sponsored and partnered today with the Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program. If you're interested in being among the best anywhere in general practice as a team in veterinary dentistry, I invite you to request an invitation. Just go to ivdi.org slash inv, like invitation, first three letters, inv. So ivdi. International Veterinary Dentistry Institute, ivdi.org slash INV, and we'll get you the information that you need. So Monique Weldon, uh, instead of a blood clot, is it appropriate to use uh, bone grafting material to fill a large defect uh, like that? And I think what she's referring to is the defect that's left uh, after some of those ectomies that we that we did. This is one. Let me get back to the slides here. This is one of those that uh, she's probably referring to in using a bone graft. And in a, si a situation like this, that the alveoli are filled with a blood clot already. So there's no no reason to try to put anything on top of the alveoli because bone's not going to grow where there's no wall of bone. So the wall is the alveolus that's left and consequently if you don't have bone on at least one wall and preferably two or more then bone's not going to grow on top of bone. So blood clots are fine for this. We've talked about this a little bit, if you recall. Blood clots are great, but you're going to lose a little bit of bone, marginal bone height. In this particular case where you've got the central incisors have been removed on the maxilla, you don't really care if you lose a little bit of, of bone uh, based on the fact that those alveoli are full and that lateral incisor is a pretty good ways away from where you extracted uh, those teeth when you did the resection. So if, if, that's, if that is the case, if it's thin bone between there, then you could put a bone graft adjacent to those lateral incisors uh, if you are seeing that there's a really thin bone margin, but usually that bone around that third incisor is pretty thick. So you shouldn't be losing any any bone around that. So I hope that answers your question. Good question. Leo, for uh, uh, con 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 congeny, congeny, um, for clients who are set against partial mandibulectomies is, is a viable option to do a partial removal to buy the pet time. And that, it, that in itself is something that you could definitely do if indeed the patient is disrupted functionally from the mass in that the, the mass is being traumatized by the tooth uh, above it or the teeth above it, or it's causing some other type of anatomic or structural change that would benefit the patient from a comfort standpoint. So doing that until referral, uh, not getting too aggressive, just eliminating that portion of the mass is certainly indicated to help the patient. If you're helping the patient, then great if you're doing it just because it, it looks unsightly, but there's no change in function or there's no disruption of that tissue from traumatizing 
teeth hitting that, then you should be uh, you should be fine uh, by leaving it. I wouldn't recommend doing anything. So uh, nice question there uh, with Leo. So Michelle, Michelle Pang, I understand surgical excision with mandibulectomy or maxillectomy is a standard for amyloblastoma. That's correct. Are there other options available? Chemotherapy, intralesional bleomycin, and there there is and have been studies done, uh, at least a couple of studies done with intralesional bleomycin, and it appears that it is in uh, some cases uh, can be curative, and consequently that might be an option for some of these patients that don't want to have or some of these clients that don't want to have that for their pet uh, where you're looking at an ectomy, but an ectomy is pretty much 100% curative with a neuroblastoma. The only time that you'd ever see that if there is some mass left, we've never had that happen. Uh, Not to say that it couldn't, but as long as you get reasonable margins, which are one centimeter in all directions, then you don't have to worry about that coming back. And it's 100%. It's not the morbidity that happens with the multiple injections of bleomycin that it takes to do this. Uh, there, there, do, there is necrosis of the tissue. There is odor. There is uh, all the changes that can occur when you start to see inflammation within tissue, which the agent causes. So it's not something that we ever recommend but it is a, it is an option in my opinion some others may support it more strongly and i don't know that there's any of our my colleagues or specialists that really support it we just know that it is an option and we can use it if we need to but i've never used it and i've never had to use it and i've been in this doing this for uh 25 years so not something that is, is really needed uh, in most cases practically, but it is, a, it is an option, Michelle, so uh, certainly a great question. Uh, Amelia <coughs> Jane, uh, what lab course do you recommend I register for for learning better and larger flap closure technique? So that, that's kind of a open question there. Um, I'll need to, need to qualify that <coughs> with a couple of answers, but I, I've done some introductory and intermediate extraction. Amelia goes on to say uh, courses previously, so I'm not a beginner, but looking to improve techniques and speed on extractions and smaller mass removals. <clears throat> so, to to answer that, Amelia Jane, looking at situation, there's a lot of people that are at, at, that are here today that are listening to this workshop they're probably in that same situation. They've gone through, they've taken courses, whether they be ours or maybe they've taken courses from other specialists on surgical extractions and they're comfortable uh, doing those. They practice them on cadavers. They're, they're doing them on patients, but they may not be doing them at maximal efficiency. They may be, and, and Amelia, Jane, you may be as well, frustrated in some cases with root tips and the time it takes to extract root tips, the frustration of actually creating the fractured root uh, with technique. And a lot of that's avoidable uh, from, from the start and certainly everyone can improve with efficiency. <laughs> it, it took quite some time before I got to be super quick as even after I got out of the specialty training, uh, it was several years in general practice before I got super quick with flaps and extractions and with not fracturing quite as many roots, although we do that, I do that all the time. <coughs> Still in, in specialty practice, but from a percentage standpoint, it's much, much less frequent than it was when I first got out and first started doing this. So I had quite a bit of training anyway prior to becoming a specialist and spending, um, I want to say, thousands of hours on cadavers uh, in order to get quick enough where I could pass the boards and so do all specialists because, and I, and I just bring this up as, a, as an aside, 
Um, we are held to the standard of having to do a practical examination that is an all-day practical exam where we've got four to five hours. Uh, actually, I think it's two, now it's two, two days, two consecutive days. We've got four to five hours to do four or five procedures, and those have to be pretty much perfect uh, in order to pass. So we have to be really quick and really good just, just to pass uh, the practical exam to become board certified. <clears throat> Dentistry and ophthalmology are the only two specialties that require a practical examination in order to get board certified. So when you think about that across the scope of, uh, especially with surgery, uh, it's, it's pretty demanding from our standpoint to, to have that pressure uh, on that one exam, that one weekend uh, uh, to, to either pass or not pass. So back to your question, it takes a lot of, of time, it takes a lot of effort, and it's like any practice. If you are practicing tennis, or you're practicing violin, or you're practicing uh, golf, uh, in my case, whatever you're doing, if you're practicing and putting in a lot of hours, if you're practicing the wrong way, you're not making any headway. So practice from the standpoint of correct and focused practice based on standards set by other people that are really good at violin and they're good teachers of violin, they're good teachers of tennis, uh, they know how to teach and they know what to teach and how to correct deficiencies. Same thing with dentistry. If you're starting out with techniques that have, you have learned some, somewhere or another and they're not the most efficient techniques, then you're spinning your wheels. You're doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And that is super stressful, super frustrating when you're going in every day or every dental day and you run into the same exact thing every time. <clears throat> you're, you're using the same techniques that you've used time and time again, and you're just not getting quicker, and it's still just as frustrating as it was um, after you started to reach a plateau. And that's what we understand, that's what I understand after teaching for all these years, is what is the most efficient way, what are the little nuances with each individual tooth that make it easy uh, for you or e much easier for you to perform those surgical extractions especially and get out of that anesthetic episode and minimize that stress as much as possible. And so that's how we teach. Uh, that's how my instructors have been taught and have been successful over the years. And so we all embrace those techniques and we all teach those techniques in our in our wet labs uh, whether that be for and back back to that question i'm not sure whether you're talking about <coughs> the extractions themselves but if you're not that puts it in perspective that even though you're you're probably really comfortable doing it you can get a lot better and we know this because we have a lot of people that are in that same category that come to our live wet labs <coughs> month after month year after year and we help them considerably, we get feedback from them, and we know how much it impacts their uh, practice, how much it impacts their, their time that they spend, how much it impacts the frustration and stress levels that they feel. So <clears throat> with that said, getting that down first, where you're good at surgical extractions, you're good at flaps, leads you into the next step in the journey and that is to do some more advanced procedures. So simple, uh, simple and surgical extractions are the base. You can progress, use those skills once you're really good at those to do mandibulectomies, to do palatal surgery, uh, to, to do more advanced mass removals, oral mass removals. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like more information about the Veterinary Dental Practitioners Program, please submit 
to request an invitation at ivdi.org slash I-N-V.